Welcome to the podcast. We're so glad that you joined us today. It is, uh, I, I usually do say it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, don't I? Because does everyone know, I mean, we mentioned this before, but that, that's like a Mr. Rogers thing. If you're familiar with Mr. Rogers. You don't know who Mr. Rogers is. Go look him up. <laughs> and um, it's, it, it, it flows so naturally. I hope everyone doesn't mind because some days are good days and bad days, depending yeah. on your perspective. But I feel like we can choose to have a good day. We and can you know what? Choose- I, I, you know what? I'm going to, ch- I'm going to just kind of take that whole Mr. Rogers thing and just like segue that into our introduction of this topic. Okay. Is that Mr. Rogers was, he did children's shows, but he was also a Protestant minister. Mm -hmm. And what he believed was that he could bring Christ to the world by simply loving people, Mm. by loving people, by being there for kids, by talking to them, by explaining things to them. And he didn't really talk about God on his show or anything, but it was simply through Loving people, yeah, loving people through the medium of the television, just as we're trying to love our podcast listeners, and, yeah. and but in a very real sense, love our children. So. Yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty good. So I, there you like go. That. So all that's right, that's right, what we're right. talking about today. Let's is, choose that. Let's yes, choose that. Yeah, all right? yeah. And um, as we're um, just before we jump into today's topic, we want to have a invitation for you. Um, we are going to be at the National Eucharistic Congress in Indianapolis. Yes. And we we have a booth, a table set up. So if you're there or if you know someone coming, please tell them to stop by. We have some free goodies, but also we'd love to meet some people. Um, and when we set up this booth, we were just thinking, uh, all I could picture in my mind was like moms and dads hauling, you know, four kids around, five kids around, and they're going through all of the booths and then they find the Messy Family Project tent. And this is the place for you. We will have stuff for the kids. We will have stuff for you. And it's going to be fun. Yes. And more importantly, and and then we also are hosting a little gathering, you know, for those who are coming with families, we're going to have a messy family picnic, right? That's right. It is a messy family picnic. And it's going to be close to the, uh, the, the place where right. the Congress is. It's, it's like going a 15 to be on minute the drive dinner park. time yeah. on Friday. And all families are welcome. We do yes. on our website, you can sign up. We do want to take registration so we can know how much food to have. Yeah, available. guys, we, ha- we, we have got to take res- registrations because we have no idea. Like we could have five families come. We could have a hundred families come. We have no idea. Zero. So please, 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 if you are even thinking about coming, go and register. We're asking for a twenty dollar donation because we're going to buy pizza. Family. We're going to buy drinks. We'll have games, and if we have a lot of people, maybe we'll add additional games and things. But the twenty dollars, I mean, if you have a big, actually it's five dollars per person. So it if it's just you and your spouse, it's only going to be ten. But twenty dollar cap for families. Um, and then we'll just have the pizza delivered. Like we want to take care of you because I know it can be a stressful time in going to something beautiful, but also tough with kids. And so we want to make like a little oasis for, for families to let your kids run around. It's a beautiful park, beautiful playground. There'll be bathrooms, there's water, drinks, all of that. And then in a, so yeah, so hopefully you can come and join us, uh, And then if you're already at the Congress, also, we're going to be doing a live podcast or recording a podcast yes. there. Uh, so we'd love to see you there. Uh, we try not to do too many things in the summer uh, for work. We do it just with our family. So we got a lot of travel uh, coming up with uh, with family stuff. So hopefully you can see us in Indianapolis and yes. then we'll kind of start back up at our normal stuff. Yeah, uh, if you will. In we the were actually really hesitating to go to Eucharistic to the Eucharistic Congress. But then people started reaching out to us, asking us if we were going to be there. And we were like, oh, we this is dumb. We, yeah. we really should do it. Like, yeah. this is a great opportunity. So help help prove us right. <laughs> this is a good I know. opportunity. I hope somebody comes. <laughs> I hope it works. Yes, we hope we see you there. Because if we see lots and lots of our listeners, then, then we'll be yeah, like, okay, did, it was worth it. And, and I'll, I'll just say this. If you're not going to the Eucharistic Congress Party, you're in the Indianapolis area. Oh, absolutely. We would still love you to come to the yes, picnic. You go know, register. That's open to they all. They find that just on the website? Yeah, messyfamilyproject.org. You can look under events and it's right there. Okay. Um, so anyway, and again, uh, the Eucharistic Congress, in case you're wondering, is uh, July 17th through whatever that Sunday is 20 something yeah. whatever that is and um anyway so hope to see you there all right let's 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 jump into today's topic and maybe i'll just set the stage for us for a little bit okay okay um so we're um we have said this i believe before or at least we do it a lot when we're out speaking and leading retreats uh, this is one of our paradigms for yeah. how we approach uh, all of the families we speak yeah, to. Yeah, and so we, we really see family life. We see families in two very distinct 
uh, pathways, two very distinct models of families. We have the frantic family, uh, the family that's kind of living for the urgent, moving along, hustling, busy, uh, and 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 just kind of floating and drifting in some ways. Not being intentional. And that not being intentional, where the other family who is more intentional, we, we're calling it the fruitful family, right. right? And the fruitful family are those that live for what's really important and those that are living with greater intentionality, that they, they don't just uh, move from moment to moment. They really have kind of a, a direction, an orientation uh, that leads them. And, uh, and it doesn't mean that the fruitful families aren't busy That's right. shuttling kids, you know, Doing getting kids place to place. Stuff. Right. right from the outside, they kind of would look the same, but the difference is that they are doing those things. They are choosing them. They're yeah. not just happening. Yeah. They're actually too, like in our um, interview that we did with Father Mike, with yeah. Father Mike Schmitz, he talked about in his family, how his, they just kind of made that decision that dad would take care of the patients. Mom would take care of the they kids. They divided it up. They understood right. their roles and their place. And, and, and right or wrong, like pass no judgment, like on that decision, another family may decide differently. But they didn't fall into that by accident. They intentionally chose that. Right. And so that's how that family could be fruitful is because they are thinking and they're thinking and acting, not just being driven by what is urgent, the, um, the demands, the expectations of the outside world, but instead thinking what is what how can we live intentionally according to God's plan? And one of the big distinctions, obviously our goal is that we, uh, and all of all of us, right, are uh, leaning more and more towards being the fruitful family. The family lives with purpose and intention. And one of the big distinctions between that is that a frantic family, when they experience the natural sacrifices and struggles yes. and, and pains and sufferings of family life, right. they resent them and they yes. try to avoid them or they seek to escape from them, right? Um, they're, they're really not soaking up, if you will, the, the, the lessons, the, the value and the worth of mm -hmm. all of those sacrifices. Right. Can I just say one thing in that this, and I really want you guys to hear this, is because that is what I see a lot of times on social media. Correct. The way that the secular world approaches family life. And I know there's a lot of memes and shorts that I watch Which are that funny. are funny, that right, are yeah. very, very funny, you know, and, and relatable. But a lot of them are coming from the perspective of, of this, these kids are a crazy inconvenience right. and, and I need to escape from them. Or just merely survive. Or survive. Exactly. And of course, and I know that we talk about surviving, um, but we actually, and which is true, but it's not just that. It's not sufficient. It's not sufficient because you have to change your perspective of recognizing that, and I feel, again, I feel like a lot of this secular world, the way, even if they have, you know, three kids, four kids, they're approaching those children, that family life with the perspective of, I am, I am, um, I, I'm not going to grow anymore. Yeah. I am who I am. And that's just the way it is. Deal with it. Deal with it. And I need to deal with these kids as opposed to being a fruitful family. What a fruitful family would see, look at their children, see the difficulties that come with family life and say, you know what? This is an opportunity for me to grow. Yeah. What is the problem in this family? Guess what? The problem is not my children. My children are not the problem. The problem is is me. How can I change myself? How can I grow in virtue? How can I become a better person right. through these sacrifices that come with family life? And, and I think just if we started looking at ourselves and sometimes it's easy to say things, right? It's easy to say, hey, I love my family. I love my kids. And yes, I'm intentionally choosing to be here. But we, in order to be... Um, to really move to fruitful families, we have to be more reflective. Yes. And, and we have to take time to really be more um, thoughtful in our assessment and in our own hearts, right? Um, and I'll, I'll just say for me, you know, there are times when I have a long day of work and at the end of that day, <laughs> I, I just want to collapse. And, and, and I, I, I'm not like, hey, woman, get me a beer and I'm going to sit down and watch TV. Because Mike doesn't drink beer. I don't drink or beer. Or anything. And, and, or, and or read or, you know. Um, but but what I, I don't want to do 
is when my kids, like during the school year, right, yeah. were like, hey, dad, can you help me with this math? I'd be like, my mind is ready to shut off. Yeah. Or, or um, it would be so easy for me at the end of the day. And I love watching movies and shows. And I, I, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to that. But it was so much easier when my, if my kids, I, I knew if I said, hey, guys, want to watch a show, I'd get them all. Yeah. As opposed to saying, hey, you know, let's go outside. And let's go shoot some hoops or let's go, let's do play something, cards. play card, do, do something, right? Yeah. And it takes more energy. It's, it's, it's a, it takes a so death, much more energy. It's a death to self. Yes. And I don't always say the right thing. I don't always do the right thing, right? And in my own heart, I realize I'm like, yeah, there's the, it's holding on, you know, there's the holding yeah. on and it's hard, you know, or, or, or it's simple stuff like, um, <laughs> uh, going in the morning and tr- putting something in the microwave and being like, oh my gosh, what, what exploded in I here? I know. Our microwave, I do not know what happened in our house yesterday, but something very, very bad happened I, in the microwave. I, I, I just cleaned it up. Something, oh, God bless you. Oh and, my gosh. And I, I was, was going to have the kid who I suspect did it I, I, clean I, it I have out. a very, I will put money down to see yeah, if we're right. Okay. Okay. It, was, um, it was really bad. <laughs> but, and that's usually not that case, but... <laughs> But it, but it's, it, it, as a parent, when we come in, we see the mess, and we're just like, get so angry, yeah. Oh, like, yeah. Oh, come on, <laughs> yeah. come on! I just yeah. cleaned this up, yeah. You know, yeah. And, and those are naturally designed sacrifices, right? It, it, I, we were we were talking at our couples group uh, about, I think it was in there, where we're talking about so many times when um, we choose a sacrifice. Yes, it was. Yeah, it, 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 it's it's easier. It's easier to say yes. I'm choosing this sacrifice. I'm choosing this. this penance. Penance. I'm choosing this discipline. I'm choosing, mm-hmm. but it's so much harder when they come to you without your choice, right? <laughs> but those are where it is most beneficial, uh, right? And but those are where it's the most challenging. It's like, mm. uh, I, I, did I sign up for this? Yeah. And see, the thing is, is that the sacrifices themselves, the difficulties themselves, don't necessarily make you holy. Okay, that's, that's right. So that's right. it's just like uh, it's just like. Dieting is different than fasting. Okay, so like um, moderating yourself as far as like your food intake, right? If you're if I'm doing that um, that's for a good just day. for myself, it's certainly a good thing. But that's not the same as okay. I'm intentionally moderating my food intake as a sacrifice that I am giving that to the Lord. A fast as a fast. So just the fact that you have children and that you are waking up in the middle of the night with them, that you are cleaning feeding the them, that you're kids, cleaning yeah. up their microwave after they, you know, whatever, that you are paying for things for them, that you are, you Buying know, giving, clothes and paying it, for braces. It, and, exactly. All of those things that we do, those are all good things that even the secular families that's do. Right, that's right. But they won't make you holy unless you see them through the eyes of, of Christ, unless you see them as Lord, my heavenly father, I am doing this. I am serving this child. We are making this sacrifice. I'm offering this to you right. as a sacrifice. And that as serve, when I'm serving my children, I am serving Christ. That's a big mindset. You know, it shift. is a mind shift. Yes, right? And exactly. so it, it is taking it for, again. And this is, it, we, we put that contrast to the frantic, the frantic family is just too busy and too caught up in the throes of the urgent for them to be reflective. Right. Where a fruitful family, an intentional family, is, is taking that pause, taking that time to reflect. And, and it doesn't mean in every second, and it doesn't mean we get it right all the time, but it's like, that. that I, I think that's a very important shift that we're mm-hmm. asking and we're inviting, and uh, we're, we're asking to do it in a messy way, right? You know, uh, recognizing that, that there are these naturally designed sacrifices. Even, I was in a messy way. I'm just thinking of somebody just going, oh God, help me. Yes, that's that, what that's we're talking it, that's about. It, that's, right. that's exactly what we're talking about. Actually, I was thinking about the book, um, The Practice of the Presence of God. And I was reading, I read that a couple months ago. And just today in my prayer, I was reading um, uh, something by Teresa of Avila. And in, in both of those instances, they just talk about having moments, instances throughout the day of recognizing that God is with you. Yeah, recognizing yeah. the presence of God within your life, within your heart. Yeah. And even if as a parent, as a mom, you have little kids, you don't have any time for prayer, you can't get to mass, all of those things, you can still be aware of the presence of God throughout your day. 
when you're feeding your baby, when maybe when you're washing the dishes or whatever it is, just having those moments of recollection yeah. of just saying, maybe it is, oh God help me, you know, yeah. but maybe it's just recognizing your heavenly father sees you. Well, he sees and, what you're doing. And, 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 and not to go off on a complete tangent here, but just to kind of emphasize we can't have those moments if we don't build in some structure to our day. Mm-hmm. You know, meaning yeah. you don't need to yeah. have a rigorous uh, airtight schedule that follows minute by right. minute. But we've talked about this many times. Having a routine that helps Routines you break, are so important. break up your day right. and gives you clarity and moments. So if you're like me, you might need, you might need um, I'll, I'll say I, I need to pray in the morning. Otherwise, my day will get taken taken up and swept along by the things that come my way, whether it be work, whether it be yes. emails, whether it be things that I already put on the calendar. So I have to create a routine where I say, okay, if I'm going to try to make this day an offering, I know for me, yeah. I need to break that up with two to three times a more substantial prayer in the morning. I have an, an alarm that will go off at noon to remind me to stop. And our listeners have heard that alarm go off <laughs> several times. Sometimes when we're podcast. recording the podcast. <laughs> But I, but I do that because I need to stop yeah, and I need to take a moment and to, to practice the presence of God, right. And bringing that to mind so that I can go back in and make it an offering. Right. Uh, because if we just think we're going to white knuckle it and say, I'm just going to do this. It's not always the most fruitful thing to do in your life, right? The most fruitful thing oftentimes is for us to have some routines that remind us that this isn't um, separate from our life. Uh, in Christ. This right. is part of our life. Yeah. This is part of what it looks like to be a disciple. A married disciple right. means that we are, are making these exchanges, these gifts uh, right. that we're giving to the Lord. And and that's the thing is that growing in holiness for the married person does not require extraordinary actions. That's what, and we, we admire people who do extraordinary things. Maybe people admire us like for doing this podcast or, you know, Please for having this ministry. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, that is not, this podcast is certainly what God wants us to do. I mean, this Absolutely. ministry, we're Absolutely. following that, but that's not what's our main normative, source ordinary. of normative holiness. Like our growth and holiness comes through our vocation as a married couple and as having, and through our children. That's right. And so we kind of forget that, that it's God makes us holy through the ordinary things. And really, if you think about it, just what is more ordinary in the life of a child than a, than a parent, right. than a, a mom or a dad, dad. like yeah. mom who's there all the time, every day, day in, day out, you know, dad who co- goes to work, comes home or is home all the time or whatever. Like parents kind of like are, are like the background of a child's life. And with that feels so not glamorous and so not special, yes. but that is how God makes people holy is through ordinary things. And, and, and we forget that. And that is the normal and it is the primary. Yeah. You know, it's it and and our world does not prize the ordinary. Right? That's you know, exactly you know, right. Like exactly. Social media, particularly in social media. And this is true before social media existed. Yeah. Uh, and it's still true today. But Even social more media so. <laughs> social media really has turned the heat up, right? Yeah. On this idea that you want to present these extraordinary things. And and all of us, like you said, are, are drawn to something ennobling, something beautiful on a big grand scale, right? Um, and and maybe it's a social media influencer that you're following. And I'm like- And that's not have, necessarily bad. Like no, it's good to have not. ideals. And, yeah. and, and there's nothing bad about doing extraordinary things. God wants us to right, do right, extraordinary right. things for sure. However, when we recognize that the world prizes the extraordinary mm. more than the ordinary, when, when, when the world doesn't prize and elevate hey cleaning up that throw up from your child <laughs> or 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 you cleaning know, out the car yeah. or the microwave or, or, <laughs> you know, and, and it, it's it's like these mundane ordinary things that sometimes just grate on us making you know? dinner every <laughs> night every night you know like teaching those kids how to drive, like changing that diaper, cleaning up the pee off the floor, you know, over and over again, like all of those ordinary things, we can, we can kind of think, I I think about this in terms of like kids applying for scholarships. Okay. 
the kids who apply for scholarships and I, and Hey, I get it. I mean, we have kids who are going to college, you know, and you're looking at all of these things and, and it's like, yeah, it is important that they, okay, how did they serve in there? Right. How did they, how did they lead in this area, that area? And that's in scholarship. They got to have some way of, you know, like checking out that this right, is a good person, right, right. but where's the scholarship for just the really good kid who maybe they didn't go to a million meetings because they've been holding down a job. They've been holding down a part-time job and, or they're coming home and they're serving mowing the their grass. family. And right. They're serving their family. Guess what? They couldn't go to all these meetings because they made it a priority to have family night. Like those are the ordinary things that there's no scholarship for that. Like there just, yeah, there just isn't. Yeah. And, and like I said, I'm not saying that those extraordinary things are necessarily wrong, but it's just an example of how like those things in our world aren't prized, but in the eyes of God, in the eyes of God, they are so important. Right. And, um, and you know, just an example from scripture. So in Mark, in Mark nine, I looked this up for a talk that I gave. Um, this is when the, um, the disciples yeah. were, you know, I, th I was thinking about like that scene from the chosen like how the disciples and Jesus are like walking, like they walked right. everywhere, right? They're all like walking, like in groups, you know? So he's like, hey, they're behind me. You yeah, know? yeah, exactly. It's kind of like, I was thinking about like us, like in our big van, like, you know, like we're up at the front and then we can hear kids like talking in the back of their like way, way in the back, you know? And that's like what Jesus is like. Jesus is like in the front of the group and like he hears the disciples in the back and they're like, talking about who's the greatest, you know, who's the, I'm going to be a great, blah, blah, blah. I don't know. Who knows? Who knows what the disciples were saying? And so they, it's in the scriptures, it says that they got to the place where they were going. They got to like a family's house, right? So they get to the family's so house. So picturing there, you're in the family's house. Exactly. Now. Again, I was like kind of picturing like a scene like in the, the chosen. I like the mother meditation. You know? This is like mother's meditation. Yeah, there. like this is like my like, you know, Lexio Divina, you know, like what I'm kind of like picturing Jesus, you know, and it's like they all come into the family's home. Like I'm thinking about like people when they come to our house, you know, and there's like kids running all over the place and, you know, and Jesus is after the meal, he's sitting back and with a glass of wine because Jesus definitely drank wine. Absolutely. Obviously all Clearly. the disciples, they're all sitting around. And then Jesus says, and this is in the scriptures. You should go read it. Mark nine. And Jesus says, he says to them, what is it that you were talking about? And Jesus a hundred percent knows what they were talking well, one, about. You one, know? one, he's God. He <laughs> right. knows everything. Two, he was actually there when they were having this conversation. He's probably out of the conversation specifically. Right. And it says in the scriptures and the disciples, like it's something like they didn't say anything. Oh, it says they were silent. Because right. And you know, they're, they're all like, like oh. oh crap. <laughs> Are we going to tell Jesus what we're talking about? And Jesus doesn't call them out. He doesn't say, guys, I know what you're talking about. Don't be an idiot. You know, it says he calls a child into their midst. So again, with the whole like picture of the family, right? He, he Jesus, maybe there's like a six year old boy who was like running around, like hitting people with swords and stuff. He calls a child into their midst. So he takes that little six year old, little imp, impish little, you know, Israelite child. <laughs> and he says, he says to them <clears throat> that the greatest in the kingdom is the one who is the servant of all and that we have to become like little children. Oh, he says, actually, thank, thankfully I have it written down here. Whoever receives That's such a child in my name receives me. And if you receive me, you receive the one who sent me. So the disciples know at this point, yeah. the one who sent him is the father the almighty God, the I am, the burning bush, the one who saved them from, you know, saved them from slavery in Egypt and all of that. And that he says, if you receive this child, it's like receiving I am. Yeah. Like that's such like a huge thing. And a child was just like the lowest of the low in the, you know, in the order of importance in their right. culture. And, and it's like, that's what we parent, that's what we're doing. We're called to that. Right. It's, mm. unbel it's unbelievable when you think about it. I mean, th there are so many times in scripture where Jesus points to 
very natural examples for us, right? Exactly. And there is no more natural, needy person. Sometimes messy. Sometimes sometimes you know, messy. Like all the all the time. <laughs> all messy. of that, right? <laughs> but he puts a child right yeah. in front of them. I mean, Jesus loved to use props, right? And and this. Kid, I know. I was like, we need to do that more in our talk. Use props. <laughs> well, yeah, but but the kids we'd bring would be yeah. you know, <laughs> maybe not actual people as props, but <laughs> but 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 Jesus calls us to receive a child. Yeah. I think there's there is both the the literary or um, uh, literally he's saying receive children, mm. and then the idea that when you receive one who has needs, who is lowly, who right. who ha- you have to serve, yeah, then you're receiving me. And right. for us as parents, as 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 busy moms and busy dads, yeah. God's saying you receive me in your children, right. And so right. what do we do? So if you, and, he, and he's saying this in contrast to you want to be great. Yes. You know, <laughs> be great in order to be great. Receive your child. Yeah. Go deep in understanding what your vocation is. A married disciple looks at his child and says, I'm receiving Jesus. Right. By receiving this child. So one, it's openness to having children. But mm-hmm. two, when you yeah. have those children and right. they're running around hitting their siblings, <laughs> You're still receiving Jesus. You're yes. receiving somebody, yes. a person, yeah. not just an idea, a person, which I think right. is really, really important for us. Be- because see, we can get very caught up into that idea of, oh God, I love you. I want to give my life to you. you know, and you go on a retreat or you have a conversion experience or, you know, whatever. And I mean, and you and I, we've experienced that Absolutely. for sure. And I'm going to tell you guys, I was so holy I was so holy before I had kids. <laughs> I I was just I was so You're holy. I, I was very very holy. I loved God so much, <laughs> and I still do. But <laughs> this is the thing. This is the great thing about being Catholic, right? Is that God knows that we need stuff. We need actual. Yes. We need actual things to learn how to really love. He doesn't ask us to just love in our minds. You know, I thought it was a thought that counts. (laughs) You know, whenever someone says that, it means that they screwed up. Jesus said that. (laughs) But, but that, but he asks us, I heard this once and it's, it is such a great challenge. The measure of your true love for God is the measure of the love you have for the person that you love the least. Mm. So think in your mind right now about the person that is the hardest for you to love in, in your the world. In your day-to-day life, right? In your day to honestly, I would say anybody. Yeah, but for, for our purposes, I think it's just- Just think about the person that you're like, I just cannot stand that person. And it's so hard for me to love them. That's how much you really love God. Because the scriptures say, how can you love the God you cannot see if you do not love the brother that you can't see? And I think sometimes for us- That is scriptural. Yeah. (laughs) Not the thought that counts is not scriptural. (laughs) Um, But I think that it's it's easy, or it's easy, it's a default for us living in a world that is more globalized than ever before, Mm -hmm. that we see uh, politics, the economy, all these social things that are all around us in the the ethos of this this world right that we forget the people that are right in front of us that's why i'm saying the people that you actually have day, daily or regular contact with because it's easy to say oh well that person that i never see mm-hmm. oh i'm gonna love them i don't they're, they're, that's the least I, I have a hard time loving love the people right here because sometimes we look past the people that we're bumping into every yeah. second of the day. And we're like, we put on our best selves when we're serving at our, our parish. Or we put on our best yeah. selves when we're out at the, the student uh, PTA, you know, for the school or whatever it might be. Right. right? But in our home, when we kind of let our guard down. Yeah. I, again, I'm not saying put your guard up and, and be false and fake. I'm saying recognize this is where the training ground for heaven is. Yeah. It's in your home. Yeah. It's it's in this place where we can do small acts of kindness, small acts of charity. Yes. We do we do all these little things with great love and it has a massive impact on the people we're serving but also on us because it's daily, it's habitual. It's 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 like anything in life, right? That anything worthy in life uh demands sacrifice. Anything yeah. that's good uh, demands that there is, is something, right? There's something <laughs> of us, but it's not so much just what we do. It's 
who we become in that process. Right. Because the path to holiness, because that's what we're talking about. We're becoming the best version of ourselves. We're talking about becoming saints, right? We're talking about stepping more fully into what does it look like for us yeah. as married disciples? What does that look like in our home? And it, and it really is very corporeal. It's very real. It's very material. It's very tangible. Because if you just talk a good game, dad, mm -hmm. if you just talk a good game, mom, and you have mm -hmm. nice platitudes, and yet you're actually speaking harshly, and you're dealing uh, with your kids in a, right. a rough and or uh, rude manner, check yourself. Yeah. Get your mind back in the game. What is it all about? This is at home. This yeah. is where our holiness is meted out. This is where we are transformed. This is where our hearts mm -hmm. are, are moved and shifted from that frantic to fruitful. And that's the, um, and being that witness to our children too, like they pick up on that hypocrisy very quickly. So true. You say that you love the Lord and then you treat your children your teenage sons, your teenage daughters, you treat them with disrespect, they they pick up on that and they'll yeah. be like, uh, if that's what religion is all about, if that if being if being a Catholic makes you treat people like this, if I don't feel loved and accepted and known, if that's that's what God is like, yeah, forget it. Yeah. I mean, and unfortunately, I've seen that happen. Yeah. You know, that's not always the reason why children turn away. Of course, they all have free will, but that is a real challenge to parents is if you are loving God. If you love him, how are you then loving the children that God has given you, even right. the ones that are super frustrating to you? Like that is, like Mother Teresa said, if you want to change the world, go home and love your family, right. you know? And that that's the, it's like a mystery of how, how is it possible? And this is just the way that God is, right? How is it possible that by going home and loving my children, I am helping to change the world? Yeah. How is that possible? I believe that it is because you're changing that child and then that child is raising children that, you know, it's kind of like goes on and on and on. And I think that it changes us. And I think that's it right there is that, you know, yeah. we, we've been talking quite a bit about our own hearts, our own minds and our own actions. It's thought, feeling and actions, right? That we need to recognize that if you, if your desire is to be, um, is to make sure your kids turn out well. That, that they yeah. that they are faithful, that they are mature, that they go out into the world and all of that. Well, it needs to begin with you. And that's easy to say, right? But like like we have said from the very beginning yeah. uh, of this podcast, it's not your job to turn your kids into saints. It's actually their job to make you into a saint. Right. And, and that doesn't mean that you abdicate your role in forming them. Of course not. It just recognizes that it you have the with greatest you. power and influence over yeah. your own heart, right? Over your own life. Yeah. And um, and so we need to flip the script uh, and look at our hearts and say, God, how are you trying to make me a saint through this? Not, why did you send me these kids? It's, <laughs> what do you want me to do with this? Yeah. How do I make this into an How do I make this this craziness? And even the, the heartache and the pain and the suffering yeah. uh, that might come our way. Right. Well, what do you want me to do with that? Yeah. How do you want to shape me uh, through this? How do I respond? And I just want to talk for a minute too about loving our spouses. Because for some people, it's actually easy. And everybody's different in the struggles that God gives them. For some people, it's actually easier to love their children than to love their spouse. Mm. It's easier for them to be Jesus. I think to you're their naturally kids. drawn to love your child that came forth from you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and other people, it's it's the opposite. Yeah, you know, everybody is, has has different struggles. But to just speak to a second for those people who have spouses that is, are really hard for them to love, right. and and I think it's good for us to realize that that is one of the primary means again of holiness is loving your children, but also you showing God's love to your spouse. A lot of times we have people who either ask us this at conferences or they email us or whatever and say like, well, my spouse doesn't yeah, do, go yeah. to church with me, yeah. you know, or my spouse, how do I get my spouse to get on board with being a fruitful family? Yeah. You like know, you, you get yeah. emails all the time. Right? right. And how, how do I, how do I get to, how do I get my spouse to be a leader in my home? Like, you know, women will say this about their husbands. How do I do that? And, and I think the first thing that you can do is not, Nag your husband. 
Check. Good, good. Don't do that because that is actually not loving him. You know, it's not loving him. It's not effective either. But I think for those women and men, if as it, the case may be, for them to recognize that it is very possible that God led you to marry this person yeah. for their salvation. Yes. For your salvation and for their salvation. And that you are the most important witness of God's love to your spouse in the entire world. That you can love your spouse with the heart of Jesus. And especially if you have a spouse who maybe doesn't share your faith, you may very well be, if they're all of their friends and coworkers and are also not believers, you may be the one believer that they know and the most important one, you know, and to never, ever forget that, that loving by loving your husband, by loving your wife, you are loving Christ and you're being the love of Christ for them. Even if they do not love you the way that you feel like you need to be loved or you want to be loved or that you feel like you deserve to be loved because that needs to come from God. Right. Right. And, And I think that that's the, a crucial part there, right? Yeah. Is that we cannot love our spouses the way um, they deserve and that we even ourselves need to love them if we ourselves aren't filled up. Yeah. If we aren't right. receiving love, right? And right. this is where I don't believe, well, I, it is not possible <laughs> to be in a Christian marriage if you are not wrapped up in the love of God. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me let me let me let me maybe rephrase that. It is impossible for you to be a good spouse mm-hmm. if you are not first a beloved son and daughter of Jesus, right? Of the heavenly Father, of the Holy Spirit. If you do not have that right, you can't bring this your your right self to this marriage. Because or as Peter and Debbie Herbeck said, what Christian marriage is impossible. That's right. The demands that God places on Christian Catholic marriages are impossible without the grace of God. And because we recognize that, um, again, there are people who are listening who have an easy marriage or it's easy to love their spouse. Right. And God bless you. Yeah. Uh, And that's awesome. And uh, you have other challenges, I imagine, in your life. Um, But even our marriage, who I'm obviously married to an amazing- Even our marriage. (laughs) (laughs) I'm married to a pretty pretty amazing woman. But, But she has to put up with with all of this stuff that I'm still working through, right? And I, likewise, mm. have to put up with stuff from her. And as a as a husband or as a father, as a, a wife, we can look at our spouses and, and see all their challenges. We see their foibles, we see their weaknesses yeah. in ways that nobody else does. And we have to deal with it on a daily basis. Right. And what are we to do with that? You know, are, are we going to look at that and resent this? Are we going to build this up? Are we keeping tally like, hey, I picked up his clothes this many times? Or, <laughs> or I, 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 hey, didn't she recognize that I took the trash out today? Or, mm. you know, whatever it might be. Right. And I'm like, we need to stop that. So that our marriage is, one, we're never called to be um, emotionally or physically in, in danger, Right. Um, and, and or be a, a carp or, or a, accept abuse, accept abuse on any level, right? That's just that. That's 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 abhorrent. not loving your spouse. That's abhorrent yeah. to the dignity of the human person, right? You, that's not respecting who you are as a child of God. But assuming that's right, the basics are are in place. Your marriage is about what you give, not necessarily what you receive. Now, in a marriage, unlike a, a parent to a child. There is supposed to be a mutual exchange, right? There is supposed to be that. Yes. But we're all going to be at different places. Because we're peers that's with right. our, we're not peers with our children, we're peers with our spouse. And I think that's vital for us to understand that. But it's, it, our marriage is much more dependent on what we bring, what we give, than what we receive. And, um, and so for us to know that we're first getting, receiving mm-hmm. from God so that we can give, God's going to say to us, hey, you know what? Get over it. There's going to be a ton of things in your marriage uh, that you just look at and say, I'm not, not, I'm not just going to ignore it. I'm going to accept it. I'm going to look at you and say, honey, I love you. And th- in my mind, that really annoys me. But you know what? I love you anyway. And I, 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 I'm going to forgive you in my mind. And I'm not going to remember. I'm going to move it on. Right. But then there's going to be loving times where we need to be able to say, 
hey, I want to talk about something right. that's right. a challenge. And, and I know I'm getting off a little bit on this, but I mm. think it's important that we recognize that growing and something that we're always working on, right? Growing in the way you communicate love to your spouse right. is part of how you grow as a human being. Mm -hmm. um, and how you grow into being the saint God has called you to be. Right. Because the way that you speak and the way that you act, they're, they're physical, uh, physical communication and verbal communication. Mm -hmm. You know, communicating to your spouse, you are first, you are priority, you are number one. And I am still working on myself. If I'm not working on myself, recognizing mm -hmm. that, hey, you know, because you don't do blank, 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 or you say this in this way, yeah, it triggers something in me. Well, out of the goodness of God, I need to work on that in me. Right. And that might mean bringing, hey, just so you know, I'm struggling with this. I Part of working on this. that may be the conversation with your spouse. Because you're supposed to be partners. Right. Partners in right. this, you're right? You're working together. And on, that's how yeah. you don't end up resenting this or pointing the finger at your spouse. Right. Depending on which finger we're talking about here. But... Um, <laughs> We need to move to that place where you're moving from looking at your spouse as the problem to as a a true Christian disciple, uh, as a, as a, dis, a married disciples that you're standing shoulder to shoulder. Yeah, that you're looking out at even your marriage, mm -hmm. looking out at your family, and saying, "How do we grow? How do we give ourselves more fully?" You know, what it makes me think of is that instead of asking why, like, oh, God, why did you make her like this? Why did you make him like this? Instead, you say, Lord, what? Lord, yeah. what do you want me to do? Yeah. What are you trying to teach yeah. me through this very frustrating way that my spouse relates to me or whatever it is? <laughs> you know, right. like, right. Lord, what are you trying to teach me in this? What is arising in me? Be when my spouse does blank, this arises in me. What is that, Lord? How do you want it? How do you want to work on that in me? Right. You know, and being open to that right. and being open to how God wants to change you in, in that way. I mean, I think that it's a whole other way of seeing your marriage and then seeing your spouse as help me. I need to grow in this area. Can you help me grow in this way? Because I'm really, whenever this happens, I react this way and I'm really struggling with that. That's right. Can you help me? And it doesn't help me doesn't necessarily mean Spouse, stop doing that, you yes. know, but it's just being vulnerable and saying, I'm really having a hard time here, right. you know, and I know that I need to grow and the Lord is going to help me grow and I need your help too, Yeah, you know, yeah. and that's part of seeing your marriage, not just your children as a way of pursuing holiness, right. like through your own personal growth, but then even in how you serve too. And, and it's so essential that we make a decision as a married couple to say, I want a great, I want an amazing marriage because yeah. your marriage is the me primary means of grace for your home. Yeah. And so the grace to be a mom and a dad comes from the grace of, of matrimony, <laughs> right. of, from the grace of marriage, right? And so the, the more that you can work on that. And then... Uh, for those who are single parents listening, the reality is, is that you still need somebody else, a community, a, a deep friend, a, a, a spiritual mother or father for you mm -hmm. to receive from. Because yeah. I give to my wife and she gives to me in a way to remind me that before I was a husband or before I was a dad, I was a husband and, and likewise, right. before you were a wife or before you were a mom, you were a wife. And before that, you were a, a daughter. And right. before that, I was a son. And we need that in our lives to help us remain and have right perspective, right? Looking at how we give ourselves because uh, single parents have so many challenges and, and we need to make sure that you're not uh, resenting them. That you mm. look at your life and you're like, this is not what I planned. Right. This is not what I, I, I signed up for. Mm. I get it. And God sees that too. And he right. looks at you and says, that's not my plan for you either, daughter. Yeah. That's not my plan. <laughs> yeah. And we need to know that as a community, as a church, as a people, as mm -hmm. a tribe, we need to look and say, the ordinary stuff of family life is what we need to pour into each other, to be present for each other. And as parents, we need to not resent them, not to look at them as obstacles to avoid, but as opportunities to grow. So I want to give you this little parable just as we wrap this wrap this part up here, talking about like the ordinary part of family life. Um, 
in uh, there's a scripture that is just always yeah. spoken to me. Um, I shouldn't say it always spoken to me. It there was a, a, a certain time in my life when having like lots of lots of little kids and running around, and I could, really couldn't do anything. Um, outside the outside home. of the home, right. uh, because just the home was completely overwhelming, and maybe uh, maybe some of you can relate to that right, right now. But that was that was um, where you were. I, at. Uh, yes, and so I would always feel bad when, like at um, at church, when they would ask for like volunteers to like go to the prison or go and like serve the poor downtown or you know, I uh, do youth ministry work or, you know, whatever. And I would always be like, I shouldn't always, but this period in my time in my life, just feel like I can't do that. Like I yeah. cannot do anything, you know? And, and it reminded me, and I remember praying about this once and reading, finding the scripture in um, Matthew 25. And so Matthew 25 is that the very, very end, this is the very last parable right. that Jesus tells. Um, the very last, and so you Sheeps think it must goats, be right? very, um, it must be very Pointed, important. Yeah. It, may be, it must be very important. And so this is the parable at the end of time, how God uh, as a king, you know, gathers all the nations before him. And then he separates them as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Right. right? And, and you can go look this up yourself. And I do have it written here. So thankfully, and he says, the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you in the foundation of the world. And he goes on saying, because, you know, when I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. A stranger, you welcomed me naked and you clothed me ill and you cared for me in prison and you visited me. And we could think about that as mothers and be like, I didn't do any of those things. You know, like I didn't participate in any of those ministries. You know, what I, what are you talking about? And even the scriptures, it says like the, the sheep say, what, when do, when did we do those things? And, and I just kind of picture Sorry, I'm going to start crying. But I just kind of picture the Lord looking at all of those mothers who are like, what do you mean? I didn't do any great things. All I did was serve my children. And Jesus is going to look at you and say, yes, yeah. exactly. You know, when you made dinner over and over again, when you sat in those hours of waiting rooms and doctor's offices and, you know, and, and hospitals and ERs and, you know, all of that time, like you were doing that for me. You know, when you did those hours of laundry and fixing clothes and taking out the stains and going to a million stores to find the right dress, the right shoes, the right soccer cleats, the right prom dress, like moms, dads, when you're doing all of that, you're doing it for Jesus. And we don't see our lives like that, you know, and we need to change that. We need to change that because all of this work that we put into our families that takes up so much of our lives. And for women, it takes up sometimes our physical health in care, in pregnancies and in childbirth and everything that goes along with that, like in, it's okay. I just, I'm, we're looking for a tissue here, but in all of those ways that we are laying down our lives for our families. And I know that there are fathers that work themselves to the bone to provide for their families. When you are doing all of this, you are doing it for Jesus. You are doing it for Jesus. And that's the most important thing, you know, and for us to recognize, even when it says, when you were in prison and you visited me, recognize that our children were in the prison of their sin. They were in the prison of their sin it, as a, as a baby born original sin, you know, and then even after baptism, the fact that we bring our children through the sacrament of reconciliation, we helped to release them from the yeah. prison of their sin yeah. by bringing them, by forming them in the truths of the faith. And then we continue to teach our children how to be fed at the altar, you know, at, from the bread of heaven, that that's what we're doing for our children. We're not just taking care of them physically, but we're also taking care of them spiritually. And Jesus looks at all of that and he says, moms and dads, you're doing this for me. Yeah. 
And But the thing is, and this is kind of how we started out this podcast, just to remind you, is that simply by doing those things doesn't bring us holiness. What brings us holiness is serving our families with the perception, with the perspective of, Lord, I'm doing this for you. Yeah, having Lord, our I hearts give, aligned. Having right. our hearts aligned. Lord, I give, I give this day to you, even at the beginning of your day, saying, Lord, all of the, all of the things I'm going to do for my kids today, all of the ways I'm going to work for them, all of the ways that I'm going to love them, serve them, Jesus, I do this for you. And, and Mother Teresa would say that she, um, I see Jesus in every human being yeah. in every need that they have so that she would say to herself, this is Mother Teresa talking, I would say to myself, there is the hungry Jesus. Yeah. I need to go feed him. Yeah. There is the lonely Jesus. I need to visit him. You know, there is the thirsty Jesus. I need to give him a drink. Right. And so moms and dads don't listen to the world. Yeah. The ordinary stuff of family life, the ordinary needs of your child, the needs in your marriage. See the thirsty Jesus. Yeah. See the hungry Jesus. See the lonely Jesus. Be Jesus and meet Jesus in your family. This is not a, you know, an easy thing, yeah. but it is pretty simple, right? It's, it's taking those ordinary moments, those beautiful ordinary moments and saying with great conviction, Jesus, I, I trust in you mm. in those moments of unknown. Jesus, help me love my spouse. And also to recognize that when you're doing that, that you have a heavenly father who sees you. Yes. You have a heavenly father who sees you, who is looking down on you with love as his son and or as his daughter and looking at you and saying, good job, good job. I see you. I see how hard this is for you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for loving my children. Yes. Thank yes. you for loving my children. Thank you for loving my sons and my daughters through loving your spouse and your children. And that's how we can live our lives, knowing, like with pride and in, in the best way, you know, and with, with confidence and knowing that you have a heavenly father who sees you, who loves you, and who's giving you the grace to do what you need to do to serve that Jesus in front of you. Yes. All right. So we have some uh, takeaways that yeah. you can look at in the show notes, uh, but we have a couple of discussion questions. Yeah. And Alicia, you, you mentioned this earlier. Uh, but but first, we just want to challenge you. Think of the person in your life who sh who shows God's love to others. What do they do? Right? H how do those people love? How do they do it? And how can I imitate them? So we're looking for witnesses, witnesses you know, before us, yes. because we need to make it real for yes. our own eyes, for our our marriage and everything. Who are those people? And then remember. Um, the, the, the scripture passage, whosoever receives such a child as this in my name receives me. And who am I being called to receive right now? Right. Who is that child in our midst, right? It might be your actual child, which it, it, it is definitely, but is there others, right? Um, you know, what are my thoughts on this person being Jesus? Are we receiving them like we would receive Jesus? And then last, what is one small practical way that I can love my husband or wife better starting today? Amen. What is one thing I can do? And if you don't know, ask them. Ask them, how can I love you? How can I love you better today? You know, how can I receive their love um, more fully? Yeah. So. All right, so let's, let's make our lives yeah. uh, more of an offering. Let's take all the ordinary mm -hmm. stuff and add God's extraordinary grace and intention and yeah. be those families who are going to bear much fruit uh, in this world with that. All right, let's pray. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Lord, we just come to you as your children, asking for the grace to love those who you have given to us. We ask you, Lord, for the grace to receive um, more fully the children that you've given us, the people in our lives, the people in our community, and most importantly, our spouse. Lord, we know that you want to give us the grace for that, and we call upon that grace. We call upon that grace, Lord, and trusting, trusting in you, trusting in our Heavenly Father, that you will accomplish the work that you have set out. Help us, Lord, to see you in every person that we meet, especially in our families. Lord Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Son, Spirit, amen. And until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Together.